you go to the Home Office website in the UK, uh, you'll find that business crime uh, is a term used to deal with a whole series of um, government so-called initiatives uh, to combat crime against businesses. Offences by employees, uh, credit card frauds on businesses, in other words, the protection of uh, businesses, companies in the UK. I think lawyers generally use the term in a rather different sense. And it's a term, after all, which many firms use to describe teams that they run and sets of barristers' chambers in this country use to describe groups who operate within those chambers. Uh, lawyers generally treat business crime, don't they, as a crime committed not against, but really by businesses. And um, be they companies or not, by businesses, by those who run them, and by those with inside knowledge or influence in the way that they are run. And these are crimes, obviously, against outsiders. Uh, fraud, fraudulent trading, uh, offences of that kind. And, of course, particularly in the modern era, offences committed against the market generally, particularly the financial market. By and large, the public, so we are told, wants to see the directors in the dock. It's far more satisfying to see the director facing a prison sentence than his company simply receiving a heavy fine. Why fine the company if you can stick the delinquent individuals inside? Uh, indeed, there is, isn't there, a strong argument in principle for such an approach. If the company concerned is a small private affair owned by the directors, what do you add by prosecuting the company? If on the other hand it's a large public company with huge investments from pension funds and so on, what's the public interest in punishing the innocent shareholders, great and small, for the delinquency of individual directors where you can prove it? May I just say in passing, uh, quite an interesting exception to this principle of going for the individual rather than the company it is provided, isn't it, by the recent Corporate Manslaughter and Corporate Homicide Act 2007. I said in the notes I have no intention whatever of dealing with that in the course of this talk, and nor have I because it's from a completely different area of activity from the commercial issues with which I'm principally concerned. But it's quite an interesting example of apparently a public demand that even if you can't get at the individual director in terms of his responsibility, where a disaster occurs, nonetheless it's important to hit the company, what one might call putting the burden completely in the opposite way uh, from the normal approach to offences of this kind. Jeff Simons, Chelsea, um, asks, during the current credit crunch, many companies will be operating on or close to the solvency point. Under the new Companies Act 2006, when does this type of activity constitute fraudulent trading? Um, the answer, I think, to that is quite simply this. Section 993, which I referred to a little while ago, of the 2006 Act, uh, doesn't in any way alter the uh, ingredients of fraudulent trading. Um, and I think I've referred to Grantham, the mid-1980s Court of Appeal Authority, uh, in this context. Uh, the answer uh, that Grantham gives, and I'm speaking now from memory without it in front of me, uh, is that um, uh, trading can be fraudulent, uh, or will generally, or a jury is entitled to treat it as fraudulent, um, where the trader incurs liabilities where he has no reasonable belief that when they fall due he will be in a position to meet them. Um, technically, the credit crunch, of course, as a matter of law, makes no difference whatever to, um, uh, to criminal liability. My rather cynical observation is, I'm afraid, a reflection of past experience, um, namely that it's almost always when things have gone wrong and the company has indeed become insolvent uh, that these um, these problems 
uh, arise and the prosecution's result. But if I may say so, the short answer is the 2006 Act has not in any way altered the ingredients of the offence of fraudulent trading. Nick Crutelli from Iowa asks the question, how far reaching is the extraterritorial reach of Section 397 of Financial Services and Markets Act regarding false or misleading impressions? Uh, for example, what about a statement made in the US and a victim in the US and a transaction in the UK? Um, I would need to check this, to be quite honest, uh, Nick, but my recollection is that Section 397, like a number of these other provisions, in this country is entirely territorially based. Since I'm speaking to an American questioner, I think I'm entitled to say we're not as ambitious in our territorial outreach as you are. Um, it's a matter I would need to check. I don't have Section 397 in front of me, but I'm fairly sure that is the case. So um, you may pluck a number of our uh, dishonest defendants uh, from the UK, but um, uh, one who performs in the same way in the United States I don't think is going to be liable to prosecution over here under Section 397.